Ladies and gentlemen, thanks for tuning back into The Scoop. I'm your host, Frank Chaparro, editor-at-large at The Block. And this is part two of our recent recording with Noriel Rubini, CEO of Rubini Macro Associates and author of the new book, Mega Threats, The 10 Dangerous Trends That Imperil Our Future and How to Survive Them. Before we dive into the conversation and the book, let me take a minute to thank our sponsors. Get ready for season three of the Tron Grand Hackathon 2022 with a total of $1.2 million in prizes across Web3, DeFi, GameFi, NFTs, and the newly added Academy and Ecosystem tracks. The wait is over. Tron Grand Hackathon presented by TronDAO. To learn more, visit trondao.org. This episode is also brought to you by Ledin. From Bitcoin and USDC savings accounts to Bitcoin-backed loans, Ledin's financial services enable you to benefit from your holdings today without selling your Bitcoin. Learn more about Ledin at Ledin.io. Ledin, where your digital assets come to life. All opinions expressed by hosts and podcast guests are solely their own opinions and not necessarily those of the blocks. Podcast guests may have taken positions in the assets or other matters discussed in this podcast. This podcast is for informational purposes only and should not be relied upon as a basis for investment decisions. For full terms, visit theblock.co slash terms dash service. Noriel, outside of the United States, companies have to, or countries rather, have to grapple with the rising price of the U.S. dollar it's really hitting various regimes hard. You claim that the weaponization of the U.S. dollar will lead to a resurgence of gold as the preferred reserve currency. How do you see that panning out and over what time frame? Um, are we at the breaking point yet where folks are going to start transitioning? And maybe you can break down the properties of gold that you think are an attractive alternative relative to the dollar? Is it just ju just that dollar strength or are there other components there, more geopolitical tensions, yeah. anti-US sentiment? Well, I'm not predicting that we're going to go back to the gold standard, a system based on a peg to the gold like we had between 1945 and 71. I'm saying that the share of reserves that are going to be going into gold is going to be increasing over time. The logic of the argument of why the dollar is going to weaken is multiple. In the US, we have a very large budget deficit and a, fisc and a current account deficit, what people call a twin deficit. In the rest of advanced economies, we have large budget deficits, but we have usually a current account surplus or a balance. So whenever you have a twin deficit, you need to have a weakening of your currency to regain competitiveness and reduce the trade deficit. And every time in the last 60 years, when the dollar was too strong and we had a current account deficit, eventually, the dollar starts to weaken. Now, what has sustained the dollar so far has been the Fed tightening faster and sooner than others. But other countries are starting to raise rates. The Fed is going to be among us, it's going to wimp out. And the gravity of a large fiscal and current account deficit implies that the dollar will fall gradually over time, but significantly. When it starts to fall, it falls by 30 40% based on long cycles we've seen for the last 50 years. However, there is a geopolitical dimension. With the sanctions against Russia, following those against Iran and North Korea, we have weaponized the dollar as a tool of national security and foreign policy. I would say rightly so. But if you are right now a China that is sitting on over a trillion dollar of dollar reserves, mm. you know, those can be seized. Mm. If I owe you a billion is my problem. If I owe you a trillion is your problem because we could <laughs> default on those treasuries, eventually if there is a conflict with China. What can they go into Euro, Yen, Pound, or Swiss Franc? Yes, but in the case of Russia, we showed that when we sanction them, we can sanction them even on the holding of other reserve currency. So what is the only other reserve? Because every central bank has some gold, 10 to 20%, it's small, it's not, not a large part. What's the only other asset that is a liquid asset that can be a reserve currency? among others, not a major one. Gold is a minor one. Mm -hmm. I'm just saying be overweight in gold. I'm not saying you're going to go all in gold. But what's the only one that cannot be seized if there are sanctions? Is gold, as long as you keep it into your own vault, if you keep your gold in New York 
the Federal Reserve Bank yeah. in the vault, they can seize it. If you keep it in London, they can seize it. But if you keep it in Beijing or Moscow or somewhere else close to you, they cannot seize it. That's why the Russian has already moved out of dollar assets even before the recent sanction. They were going out of dollar. Their entire sovereign wealth fund divested out of dollar before the Russian invasion of Ukraine. And now the Chinese have to figure out how they get away from dollar assets and going to something else. And increasingly, it's going to be gold. So I'm not thinking about gold as being the mm -hmm. base of a new global currency. It's That's not going to happen. It's going to go from 15, 20% to 40. Something like something this. Something like that. More. I don't know whether 40, but as a reserve currency, as opposed to a currency, as a store of value, is going to become a more important store of value over time. Now, gold has been moving sideways this year because dollar is strong, real rates are rising, and therefore gold is weak. But that's assuming the central banks remain tough. My view is that as soon as the central bank go out, tips are going to do well, short-term treasury are going to do well, gold is going to do well, other precious metals are going to do well. And dollar is going to flip. And dollar is going to start to weaken. Yes, absolutely. So I think that the narrative that you're outlining for some folks listening might make them think of a bull case for, for Bitcoin because of its fixed supply, it can't be seized. Do you, do you think just generally, you've always been a critic, but is there a point at which like Bitcoin exists for a long enough period of time at a level of volatility and price stability that just because it's been around, it can serve some of those functions? Well, you know, if uh, the value of Bitcoin remains either at current level or slightly higher or lower, it doesn't matter. Most people want to hold Bitcoin because they expect the value is going to go from 20 to 40 to 100 to a million. Some people say whatever not. Uh, so if something is there that doesn't have an underlying intrinsic value and is moving around 20,000, what's the point of holding it? You need to get some gain. Now, Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies, we know they're not currencies. They are not a unit of account. Nobody's pricing anything in Bitcoin. They're not a scalable means of payment. You can do only five transactions per second with the Visa Network 50,000. They're not a stable store of value. Yeah, it's they definitely can, not. It's very volatile. That's why I go to all these crypto conferences. They never accept Bitcoin as payment for the conference fees. Why? Because your entire profit margin, 10, 15%, can be wiped out overnight if you're holding Bitcoins. They're not stupid. But they'll they take dollars. USDC. Huh? They'll take USDC or a stable coin. Yeah, but those, uh, the great innovation in crypto, people say, what's the great big killer app? In, they say stable coins. Mm -hmm. What's stable coins? It's a fiat currency. The whole point about crypto is fiat currencies are going to be doomed because of inflation. The basement, you're going to hold something, it's going to be doomed because of inflation. So that's the great innovation. I mean, stable coin, to... that's a revolution. I mean, come on. It's and, quick. And, it's going, and it's going to be, by the way, fully regulated. Any stable coin yeah. US has to have a bank license, have massive liquidity, no maturity mismatch, capital, everything. It's going to be a narrow bank. You have to pay interest on the borrowing. You have to pay inter You make money on you the lending. To, you don't have to kick You're not back. going to make money. But you don't have to kick, they don't have to kick back the interest rate or the yield, rather, that they get in, uh, from that money sitting in a bank. Like circles printing money because they don't have it's it's almost like you can think of these structures as like a mutual fund where they're not giving the end user but they're a not, yield. They're not going to make money because you have, to borrow money you have to pay the overnight interest rates, whatever four percent on a one year. Suppose you invest everything into a one year treasury safe, then you make four percent, you pay four percent, you cannot make a profit well, because making, it's a well, narrow bank. As as interest rates rise, these stablecoin issuers are making tons of money. They're printing it. Uh, they're printing it because right now they're not paying interest as much on their borrowed money. Eventually, nobody's going to want to have a stable coin that pays zero interest rate when you can get 4% for your deposit in the bank. You might as well go for the traditional deposit. So yeah, that, that's that, a good, that, that's that a good arbitrage point. That's a good is point. not going to work. Eventually, a narrow bank, by definition, doesn't make money. You can make money on some transaction fees of some sort. That's what they, they have. Been, yeah, they, in they their have, business plan, actually, is the yeah. transaction fees, treasury management, and whatever not, that is the fee money. It's not really the... There is no intermediation margin yeah. by definition because there is no maturity mismatch. Banks make money because you borrow short, you lend long, and there is a yield curve. That's where you make money. If it's a flat yield curve, you cannot make money. You can make pennies. Do you think that there's a tailwind in, in developing countries sort of adopting... Bitcoin? No, the, the one case that has formally adopted its legal tender we know is going bankrupt. 
El Salvador literally is going bankrupt. They were already having massive amounts of debt. Now they're borrowing Bitcoin, the IMF, and everybody told them, you guys are crazy. You have this lunatic <laughs> of a president. He's a total lunatic. This country, I can make a bet. You want to bet $1,000, $10,000 is going to default on his debt. In the next 12 months, you want to make a bet? Yes. Okay. Next 10 months, I'll take the other side. <laughs> can't believe I'm taking the other side of El Salvador <laughs> defaulting. Um I thought there was one part of the book where you kind of um, were reflecting on the GFC and you you said that a lot of the folks who basically thought you were crazy at the time said you relied more on intuition than you did maybe like hard data or quantitative analysis. Back then, right, there was this this gap between what the rating agencies were saying that these mor mortgage-backed securities were worth and the actual sort of makeup of those of those financial instruments, right? If you looked at them, they'd have a A rating, but the mortgages were crap, um, complete garbage. Where do you see similar sort of like um, dichotomies or examples of cognitive dissonance between what the data and the underpinning raw makeup of certain things is relative to the impression that we have in the market. Where are people um, in a similar situation as before the GFC where you had these derivatives that were viewed as not risky but inherently comprised of very risky um, assets? What are maybe a few examples that where you see something similar today, like a, a gap or a chasm between the reality and what people think is the reality? Does that make sense? No, it makes make total sense. sense. Make total sense. You know, during the GFC, the problem was excessive leverage of households, mortgage and debt and so on, and banks will lend to households in mortgages. Um, today, the problem is more with the corporate sector and shadow banks rather than formal banks. Okay, so the zombie, the zombie companies? Yeah. What's the data on that? I think okay. you mentioned in the yeah. book. But yeah. Okay, so let me give you the following uh, explanation. Before the... COVID crisis, the Fed was writing every few months a financial stability report. Mm -hmm. And then, and also in Europe, the warning sign was the amount of leverage and debt of the corporate sector, mostly high yield and fallen angels. Fallen angels are those who used to be investment grade, but now they've been downgraded just to below investment grade. They're beginning to be like junk bonds. Mm -hmm. And everybody worried about it in the US, in Europe, in advanced economies. Then, paradoxically, during the COVID crisis, those zombies not only did not go bankrupt, but they were rescued because we bought even high-yield bonds and we backstopped every business in the economy. So those zombies survived and they borrowed even more. And the excesses were high-yield, they were fallen angels, were leverage loans, were CLOs that were the equivalent of the CDOs toxic in the financial crisis and these covenant light instruments that had very, very weak covenants in case you were defaulting and so on. That was a massive debt problem that became much bigger during the COVID crisis. Now, instead, interest rates are rising and the stresses are going to be exactly high yield, some high grade, fallen angels. The entire CLO market right now that was booming for most of the year is shutting down right now. The spreads are through the roof. The entire leverage loan market is shutting down. There is already a massive squeeze in credit markets. And we don't but have we're the only slack. the beginning. Yeah, we don't have the slack to bail them out this time. No. There's zero slack. We don't because we have to raise interest rates. The Fed is only at three. The markets are pricing that the Fed by next year is has to go to 5% Fed funds rate. If the Fed fund is at five, 10 year treasury are going to be around six plus. Credit spreads are going to be double digits. They're already closer to double digits right now. They're going to be much higher. So those zombies are going to have a shock to their balance sheet because of that servicing ratio, and they'll have a shock to their income statement, p &L, because those were the zombies that borrowed too much because they didn't have enough income and revenues and they were over-borrowing. So you get a perfect storm of the p &L and balance sheets hitting you. They're going to go crashing. Have you seen how Coinbase's bonds are trading? Um, it's, yeah, it's pretty bad. I mean, they're basically bad. trading as if the company will be bankrupt in a year. 
uh, absolutely the case. And if I do understand, actually, the assets that uh, Coinbase manages for you in a situation of uh, bankruptcy may not be essentially safe, right? They might be subject no, to put in the same insurance. pool. I think they have insurance. but um... I, I think that if you have any type of crypto that is managed by Coinbase uh, in a situation of bankruptcy, if I'm right, uh, is going to be the same pool of assets. doesn't have any seniority based on the legal framework that they're using. So, so you're advocating and for certainly they not don't your have keys, a, not your huh? coins. Huh? Said you're advocating for uh, not your keys, not your coins. <laughs> yeah. Get ready for season three of the Tron Grand Hackathon 2022. There are a total of $1.2 million in prizes up for grabs in Web3, DeFi, GameFi, NFTs, and the newly added Academy and Ecosystem tracks. So what are you waiting for? Join Tron for an opportunity to showcase your work, win funding for your project, and network with other builders in the community. Tron Grand Hackathon, presented by TronDAO. To learn more, visit trondow.org. I also want to give a shout out to Ledin. Ledin, Bitcoin backed loans and savings by Bitcoiners for Bitcoiners. As we've seen, not all digital asset lenders are created equal. Ledin prioritizes safeguarding clients' assets with its robust risk management approach. That is why Ledin doesn't actively trade or invest in DeFi yield generation strategies with its clients' assets and only supports Bitcoin and USDC two of the highest quality and most liquid assets in the industry. Ledin is also dedicated to transparency, which is why they are the first digital asset lending company to complete a proof of reserves attestation. Learn more about Ledin at ledin.io. Ledin, where your digital assets come to life. Uh, I feel like we've barely scraped the surface. Mm -hmm. We haven't even touched on climate change. Yeah. Um, you mentioned on Odd Lots that, what did you say, like, Florida's going to be underwater? I'm going to have to worry about my Sarasota house? Or or actually, I'm three miles from shore, so maybe it'll be beachfront property soon. Well, today in Florida, if you are literally on the shore, you cannot get any more uh, essentially flood insurance and home insurance in general. And this is and what's going to hit the housing market in your view, because there's the argument, the sort of bull argument for the housing market is that folks that locked in these low rates, they're not going to want to sell. And that kind of creates a sort of floor maybe for home prices. But yeah. you're saying uh, natural disasters, climate change are going to are gonna sort of shift the value around of the market where places in the north, Northeast, Midwest, Canada will see a surge in demand while areas like Austin that are, that will be devastated by rising temperatures and droughts will be impacted and, uh, areas like, you know, let's say Florida yeah. Gulf will, will be impacted by now, rising sea levels. Those things happen but does gradually. That no, out? no, no. Those even happen gradually over time. In the short run, the bust of housing is going to come from the fact that mortgage rates are rising. And whether you have a variable rate or a fixed rate, as long as you buy a new home or you try to refinance, you're not going to be able to afford your home. And we'll have a recession where people's income and jobs are going to be a threat. So when you have a recession, interest rates are rising, that's a perfect storm for housing. In past recessions, we had a recession, but we're cutting interest rates. This time around, we enter a recession, and unlike GFC, we're raising interest rates. So it's a double whammy for anybody who wants to be a homeowner. Either you already have a home or you want to buy. That's why new home sales are dropping like a stone. Then over the next 10, 20 years, we'll have the effects of climate change. And the point I make in the paper is that there are studies, MIT, charts of the US, the two coastlines because of sea rise levels are gonna be increasingly flooded. The East Coast because of the hurricanes is gonna be a threat starting with Florida, Texas, Louisiana, but also the Northeast. You have in the West a drought that is a decades long drought that just started from Colorado, California, it's getting worse. There is no water. One third of all vegetables, two thirds of all fruits and nuts in the US are produced in California. The farmers are selling their water rights. And with droughts, you have wildfires that are becoming bigger and worse every year. And then you have the Mississippi River Valley where there is increased flooding. So if you project over the next 10, 20 years, given the current trend of climate change, a good third of the US is not gonna be habitable. You'll have a massive migration. And I say, 
people went from New York to Florida, and they went from San Francisco to Austin because of all the reasons, the taxes, the good weather, and whatever not. However, if you are thinking about it rationally and where you should be, there will be a reverse migration towards the Midwest into Canada. That's going to happen gradually because today you cannot get home insurance along the coastlines of the United States where there is massive flooding or hurricanes and so on. You cannot get a 10 to year mortgage, period, because you don't have home insurance. Yeah. That's been a headache for me with the storm. Well, you're three, three miles away from the coast, but your home was also partially maybe damaged. Yeah, right, there were the some storm. issues. The AC was messed up. Okay, but it was not severe. Not severe, no. But it's, if you're um, in Fort Myers and so on, oh my God. Got it's really, crazy. Yeah. I'll tell you a funny by story. By the way, every, every time in the past, by the way, when we had these storms, first we had FEMA insurance, flood mm-hmm. insurance that was totally subsidized. Now they're going to make it market rate because we cannot anymore have people keep on rebuilding in the same floodplains and the same hurricane area. And we had another big bailout. You know, when it was Sunday, 50 billion, or the other one, 50 billion. We cannot afford having every time there is a hurricane, 50 billion here, 50 billion there, and FEMA mispricing insurance. And that's going to be really changing the behavior of people. You kept on rebuilding in the same place where there's another hurricane. You didn't care. The government's going to pay. It's going to bail me out. That party is over. You have to start moving. Problem of the common. You have to start moving. Yeah. Um, what's the definition of insanity? <laughs> I'll tell you a funny story about my yeah. grandmother. Uh, her condo building was really impacted hard by the storm. And I called her, and she didn't tell me that they, the government, the Florida governor basically sealed the building off, um, and they weren't sure about the sort of structural integrity of the, of the building. And I was like, I was like, no, no, like, why are you not more concerned? She goes, <laughs> she goes, Frankie, I haven't insured. I hope that building tumbles into the ground. And I was like, but what about like, you know, your, 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 your pictures of your mother, or like your jewelry and gold bars from Italy? She goes, oh, I grabbed all that. But if the building collapses, how's the insurance company going to know if it's in the rubble or not? I got this 85 year old woman's just like giddy about committing insurance fraud. Um, but you have to appreciate her, uh, her, well, those her people, those people were in that building in North Miami, about a hundred of them died. That was crazy. And that, by the way, is that a canary. Crazy. No, it's not crazy. It's a canary in the gold mine because it's literally a sign of thousands and thousands of other buildings going to collapse or if they're not going to collapse, they're not going to be habitable. Is that habitable. in the book? Well, I speak I mean, about it. Uh, of course. Co- I've missed that part. Well, I speak about the environmental damage destroying most of real estate. I mean, the banks are asked to do stress tests on stranded assets because of climate change, but most of it is energy and other stuff of that sort, right? The shocks to the big oil. They haven't done yet a true stress test on what's going to be the impact on commercial wow. residential real estate of global climate change. Not The Fed has not done that. So we already have a trillion dollar of stranded assets because of energy. You'll have probably several trillion dollars of Stranded assets in real estate. Once you measure correctly the risks, okay, is not even in the in the t- stress test of the Fed. Literally, nobody's done that work because until now you didn't have the data. Now you have data, big data, the level of every single building in the United States, in every town, in every county. Big data. There are some providers, and you can layer those data and figure out what's the risk of a hurricane, flooding, blah blah blah, and so on. And that and risk is increasing. And that's what we're trying to do right now. We're using those big data to measure for every public grid what's the risk and therefore what are those that are resilient. So that can that go into the ETF? You identify, uh, you know, sort of baskets of property yeah. that will be on the lower end of that risk spectrum as yes. a hedge of sorts. That's yeah. interesting. Yeah, we take every REIT in the United States and for every REIT you can know exactly every asset in the REIT. And you can measure the environmental risk to those assets mm. one by one. And therefore, you can have a portfolio of public REITs that should be doing well with inflation and the basement, but they're going to be a disaster if you're exposed to the part of the country that are at risk because of climate change. But because of those data, you can choose and select them and incentivate them to go into safer assets. Yeah. I guess we can maybe close out with geopolitical risk. I hope this isn't an overstatement, but I guess maybe... <laughs> The, the the more optimistic aspect of your take on this is that we're maybe entering a Cold War 2.0, but will that necessarily result in hot wars between global powers in this new multipolar 
uh, in a situation? We don't know yet, and I hope not, because if there's going to be war between great powers, the risk is that it starts as cyber warfare mm. and asymmetric warfare because our enemies don't have the weapons yet to fight us conventionally and conventionally. But then it ends up into a conventional warfare, like this happened right now in Russia, Ukraine. And that unconventional warfare can end up into unconventional use of essentially nuclear weapon or other weapons of mass destruction. We know we are in a severe Cold War with China, and that Cold War by the day is becoming worse. And by the way, mark my words. They're going to invade Taiwan? No. Mark my words. We have started October of this year, the United States, a complete economic war and technological war against China because the decision to restrict the export of semiconductors and of semiconductor components, not only produced by the U.S., by design by the U.S., to China for uses in AI, machine learning, quantum computing, civilian and military, that's a declaration of total warfare. Before Pearl Harbor, what did the U.S. do? They restricted the export from the U.S. to Japan of what? Scrap metal mm -hmm. and oil. And that was so much of a threat to Japan that they attacked us in Pearl Harbor. Okay? Now we're doing something to China that is much more severe. This is just an escalation. Before it was just Huawei, ZTE. Mm -hmm. This is every tech firm in China is not going to have access to this. And not only stuff that we produce, but also things that Europeans or people in Taiwan or Korea produce as long as there is a U.S. design. This is something that China is going to react. This is the beginning of something that was a Cold War that becomes nasty. And that's the beginning of the Chinese then taking other action. They're going to escalate the conflict with the United States. By the way, in Taiwan, 50% of all semiconductors in the world are produced by Taiwan. 80% of the high end. If there is even a blockade of Taiwan, let alone an invasion, or if they bomb those factories, it's an economic disaster. Because we saw what happened during COVID, where just the lack of supply of 5% of chips implied that entire factories of cars and other shut down. Chips today are more important than oil for the global economy, because without chips, you don't produce anything. Can't make and, that's anything. The, and, that's, and that's the real, the hotspot right now. And we are on a collision course with China. That's why Eric Schmidt and Eric Kissinger wrote that book about fighting the battle to win AI, machine learning, computing, quantum, and otherwise. Because if we don't do it, China dominates not only the industries of the future, but it's going to be the biggest military power in, in rock, the world. We're in a rock and a hard spot because the more we accelerate our um, that's why into yeah. AI, it, it only will expedite or hasten that path to that more dystopian future. Uh, but if we don't, then China wins, and yeah. then we have a geopolitical issue and an AI issue. We, we, we have no choice but essentially trying to contain China in its attempt to dominate the industries and the military powers of the future. But that leads to a collision course where this Cold War becomes colder, and even just the economic warfare can be perceived by China as a threat to their economic livelihood. And the same way in which the Japanese attacked us in Pearl Harbor because not having U.S. oil and scrap metal was a threat, the Chinese are going to react in different ways. And that escalates the time at which they may try to have take over Taiwan. The U.S. Defense Department the other day made a statement that now the Biden administration fears, this was the head of the U.S. Uh, Navy Command, the U.S. fears that China is going to try to take over Taiwan by 2024, okay? We're late 2022. Could be as, as early as a year from now. This is the official view of the U.S. government. It's not anymore 10 years from now. Of course, Xi Jinping got his third term because he wants to pass to history as the man reunited mainland with Taiwan. And people say it's going to take five to 10 years. Now, the entire essentially, yeah, timeline community. is front-loaded because if the Chinese wait five years, we're going to arm Taiwan to the point in which they cannot essentially take it over. And they know it, so they have to front-load the threat. We are on a collision course. Makes and this Russia, is just... Makes Russia, Ukraine just seem like a blip on the radar. Uh, it could be a blip in the radar, or in the next three months, 
Russia could use tactical nuclear weapons against uh, Ukraine because they just wear each other out, though. I think there's an argument to be made that maybe it ends up like a North Korea, South Korea situation where they 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 reach that demilitarization zone. None of them are really advancing and they just establish a quasi border of sorts and just that's what exists. The best scenario in which is one in which you have either de facto or formally a ceasefire. And certainly by the time of the winter, the conflict is going to stop. But suppose that the Ukrainians, within the next month, they take over Kherson, that has a symbolic value for the Russian, a more tank. At that point, the Russian might decide the only way to stop, essentially, the Ukrainians, because we cannot do it conventionally, is by having a tactical nuclear weapon that's going to wipe out some of the Ukrainian division on the field. But if they use a tactical nuclear weapon against Ukraine, the U.S. is already officially on board of saying we're going to attack Russian troops within Ukraine, but not Crimea. There's never been a situation in which a U.S. soldier killed a Russian or vice versa, even during the depth of the Cold War. If you start having an attack by the U.S. against Russian troops, that's the beginning of a conventional conflict that involves all of NATO, and whether that conflict remains conventional as opposed to become unconventional is anybody's guess. And that is a risk in the next three months before the winter sets in, and then, of course, there'll be some freezing of the hostilities. We hoped that the hostilities freeze, there is a ceasefire, but before that happens, there is a tail risk that is rising of an escalation. Mm. That's pretty scary. <laughs> well, it definitely makes me feel uh, worried. Is that... Um, that's probably the point. Yeah, you know, the point is to worry so that we can do something about it. Mm -hmm. Honestly, it's not about saying we're doomed, but uh, let's start thinking. And by the way, as I always say, young people are going to live through this mess. I'll be dead in the next 30 years. So it's climate change, nuclear winter, financial meltdowns, pandemics or whatever. So it's unfortunately, most of young people don't vote or they're not politically engaged because you can really vote people. I mean, you know. Trump is a dinosaur. Biden is also a dinosaur. With due respect to both of them, they're close to 80, literally. And I prefer Biden to Trump. But, you know, you need a new generation our whole of government, young people. Our whole, I mean, even if you juxtapose our government with the UK, yeah. they have a lot of folks in their cabinet who are 38, 37 yeah, in the United yeah. Kingdom. The new, the new PM is the youngest yeah. uh, prime 42. minister. Yeah. I mean, really, at least it may be good or bad, whatever not, we can discuss. Yeah. But, you know, have somebody who's reflecting uh, at least the views of younger people. I mean, it's really, so we cannot, we have a gerontocracy. It's so At funny. least in the public sector, not in the private sector. All the smart people go in the private sector and it's bad. Because, yeah. you know, if you don't have good public policy, even with a strong public sector, you are really doomed. That's why I spent two years in the U.S. government, really. I left academia. I had a pay cut of 50% compared to my salary at NYU. And I worked for the White House and Treasury for two years. It was great. It's important. So all of you guys should also go into government at some point. Maybe That's I'll, really, yeah. I it's should, a very uh, honorable thing to serve your country. Seriously. I should and be, to uh, change it for the better. Because you can individually maximize your income and your success of a business. But then if this world is doomed, you're screwed too. You can't take right? it with you. Yeah, you can't take it with you, literally. The collective dominates any individual success. So... That's, that's the risk. Well, thank you for striking the fear of God into our hearts and souls. Yeah. It's great. Great seeing you. Great um, seeing you. You were not aware of these mega threats before. I mean, they're all things that are in the press every day. I'm surprised. Didn't they just uh, think, write about the obvious? I think when, I you, no, I think when you combine it all together, <laughs> exactly. it, it is much See, scarier. There are thousands of books of climate change, thousands of books on pandemic, thousands of books about, uh, you know, AI and so on. But there is not yet a book. The way I think of it is a 10 by 10 matrix. Each one of these threats affects the other and vice versa. Well, that's versa. the other thing. They're that's so intertwined. The, they're intertwined. That's, I think, part of the value added. And that's what makes it like difficult to solve, right? Like when you have yeah, a yeah, wire yeah, that's yeah. tangled in it. You know, yeah, yeah. You can't and you can resolve one problem because there'd be ten, nine other, the other ones. One. If you resolve one, there are other nine ones that are going to still doom you. So you have to, and they're connected to each other. So you need really a completely holistic uh, uh, solution and framework, individual level, business level, government level, collective level, national level, international level. That's a complexity. That's a challenge. I'd like to thank you again for joining us on the show. Yeah. 
We've been joined today by our guest, Noriel Rubini, CEO of Rubini Macro Associates. Uh, where can our listeners learn more about you and, and the book and the upcoming ETF? Well, on, on the book, if you go and search for Mega Threats and my name, you're going to find it on any It's online. already like top of Amazon? Yeah, it is top of Amazon. It's going to be soon a bestseller across. So it's easy to buy it online or in a bookstore or whatever. It's available in print, in Audible, Kindle format, or any other ones. You know, this financial innovation, it's a first a index, then a fund, and then it's going to be developed in the next few months and launched by the end of the year. And if you go to nurielrubini.com, you see my work, my research, my writings, uh, podcasts, and you name it, and so on. So I have a few other you know, economic consultancy, but those are more for institutional investors rather than retail investors. But there are also a service called boombus.com that uses both qualitative and quantitative analysis to see when an asset price is in a bubble, it's going to go bust, or when it reached the bottom and it's going to recover. It's worked quite well as well. So Fantastic. there are a whole few financial tools that you can think about. And in the book, I, I talk about the financial solution to some of these problems in terms of asset allocation and so on as well. So, and we kind of got uh, into some of that. Tips, yeah, we did. Gold. Yeah. And appropriate types of resilient public REITs as well. Yeah. Yeah. Among others. Yeah. Thank you again. Thanks. Appreciate Great. it. Thanks for having our, me. Our neighbor. Yeah. Yeah. We are neighbors. <laughs> The Scoop will be back for you again with another great guest. Have a great day. Looking for more great insights from The Block? Check out The Block Research, the premier platform for research content on crypto markets and the digital asset industry. The Block Research membership includes cutting-edge reports, webinars, company maps, and more, available via our dedicated research portal. Visit theblockresearch.com to find out how to join today or contact a member of our sales team at sales at and let them know that Frank sent you.